welcome everyone and thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Gashford Begush. I'm a, an assistant professor of linguistics here at UC Berkeley. And it is a great pleasure today um, that I was given an opportunity uh, by the Social Science Matrix to um, organize this a workshop um, with the title Understanding AI, Humanities, uh, Social Sciences and Technology. And uh, we're, have a, we're gonna have a, a very exciting day focused on um, questions that are really, really important right now. Um, I think all, everyone in this room agrees on that. And um, we wanna understand where the field of AI interpretability is currently, uh, what it can bring us, us, and where should we go from here? What are the future directions? And how can we make this, a, you know, how to, can we make this research area appropriate and, and effective and um, successful? So um, the most important thing, I think, is to bring an interdisciplinary perspective to this uh, question. So I'm very excited about today because we have people from, people from really um, different areas of academia, technology, um, industry, and science and humanities, which is, I think, extremely important. So I'll just start by framing this discussion. Um, so I think we understand the world around us pretty well, uh, relatively well. Um, but there are still a lot of things that we can discover. And for the first time, maybe, in history, we have a non-human intelligence that can help us in discovering new things. And that, I think, is very exciting. And it requires attention, and it requires a lot of um, focus. So AI interpretability, um, I think, and I think some people agree with me, is, is right now the frontier of AI research. Performance is great. I mean, we have large language models that are performing really well. We have um, you know, diffusion models that are doing all sorts of amazing things. They're predicting great stuff. Um, but we don't understand the inner workings, okay? We, it is very difficult to understand these models, what they're doing, and, and try to understand their inner workings and internal representations. So we, I think the field is now really moving into trying to make any kind of um, advances in understanding how AI is learning. And there are a couple of ways to do that. We can look inside the models, and, and you know, we can call this internal interpretability, and we'll hear some talks about that. We can also look at uh, outside of the models and use the models themselves, prompting, to try to understand what they're doing internally. And that is now um, maybe a new direction because the models are so huge and big, and they're performing so well that it's actually quite difficult to do the internal interpretability. Now, if we pair performance of these models, which is really, really good, I think we all agree on that, with understanding of how they do things internally, we have a really big potential to get new causal insights for any data type, right? And we've seen some of that already happening. So in geometry or in protein design or in fields, in various fields, um, scientific, um, pairing the performance of models with internal understanding brings you to new discoveries. Because humans, we are biased, in a sense, by our biology, and we see things that are important to us. And now we have this artificial intelligence, which is not biased by bi biology in the same way we are, that can help us. And I think that's, that's really interesting. And I dare say this is, you know, it's for the first time that we do that. So, and there are a couple of really far-reaching questions that we are asking and that we'll be asking ourselves today. Uh, one is a big, profound question. Can a scaling of these models that already are pretty good, can they bring to, you know, human level performance, right? And I personally will talk a little bit about animal research because there, where we've been asking a very same question for a very long time. Are humans just very, very smart animals and language and all, you know, everything that we do, culture, 
our, our humanity evolved just by scaling? Or is there something specifically human, some, some magic thing that is needed for human intelligence? And you know, that really well translates to artificial intelligence. Um, is, is, you know, is, are the models that we currently have, do they contain all the architectural properties that are necessary for AGI, or will we need to discover something else? And those are really difficult questions, uh, but they're very important because if we, if there is only, if this is really a, only a scaling problem, then, you know, we just need to build bigger. If it's not, then we need to rethink our architectures. And so I think we all agree that AI interpretability is a very, very difficult problem, at least in the current, current state of affairs. Um, but it has enormous potential. And I think an interdisciplinary approach is really necessary to do this right. So that's why I'm very excited today to um, you know, welcome scientists, um, uh, from all around the, um, back, or from all backgrounds, from academia, from humanities, social sciences, from the industry. Um, and I think some of the goals that we can set for today, as I mentioned, we want to understand what is the current state of the affairs in AI interpretability. Um, how can we, how can an interdisciplinary approach help us get farther um, in this area and how what, what do we have to do to, in the future to make better uh, advances in in understanding the internal workings of these models and so I, I truly believe that if we understand how humans learn and how ai learns um, we're gonna we're gonna be able to understand how we're similar from machines and how we're different, and that is gonna be important because by by understanding where their potential is, that you know where the potential of the non-biological intelligence is um, versus our biological intelligence can can help us take AI and really use it for our um, for our purposes. Okay, so the on on the plate for today I have we have some amazing talks. Um, and we will start with Professor Benjamin Bratton um, and uh, a, a talk uh, by Dr. Ba uh, Joshua Batson from Anthropic. I will talk then, um, Dr. Claire Webb will talk and Professor Don Song. And then we will have a round table uh, to kind of you know, come together, um, uh, summarize what we, we discovered today and, and maybe um, set some goals for the future. So this is for today um, and after that we'll have uh, lunch where we can exchange ideas as well um, and yeah so this is roughly um, what we have um, this was a short introduction to, to today's agenda and it is a great pleasure now for me to introduce uh, Professor Benjamin Bratton who is a professor of philosophy and technology of, of the philosophy of technology and speculative design at the University of California San Diego and the director of Anikitera a research and development organization reorienting planetary computation as a philosophical, technological, and geopolitical force that is incubated at the Berggren Institute. Um, Professor um, Bratton, I'm very excited about your talk. Um, who, uh, who bring, uh, Professor Bratton brings philosophy to all these important questions, and I think this is absolutely invaluable. And so um, I welcome you to the for, first to open the, the meeting today. Right. Um, thank you um, very much for the invitation to, to join you here today and to share some um, notes as I have it on the on the topic of AI, actually illegibility, um, which is not quite the same thing as interpretability, but you'll see it's a there's some, there's some, I hope, some, some connections between the two. So let, let me begin then with, as, as philosophers do, by sort of questioning the language of the premise or the premise of the language about what we might mean by uh, interpretability as such. There's lots of ways in which something um, might be uh, uh, uninterpretable or illegible. There's illegible handwriting, uh, such as my own. Um, there's maybe an illegible language that we're not familiar with. There is something that is deliberately made illegible, like encoding. Um, there's illegible intentions, like a good poker player might have. And then there are sort of forms of mind, let's say, that are irreducibly 
uh, uninterpretable to one another, such as the planet Solaris in the, in the Stanislaw Lem novel. Um, so what I want, um, but before I get into that, let me take a little bit of time to introduce this. So Antikythera, um, as was mentioned, is a research program that I directed at the Bruin Institute. It is named after the uh, apocryphal first computer. Um, a lot of our work has to do with what we call planetary computation, which is thinking about computation, not only in terms of calculation and algorithm and, and so forth, but also as a form of infrastructure um, that not only operates at a planetary scale, but indeed over the past century has revealed the planetary as the condition by which uh, thought emerges and by which in which action takes place. Um, much of this is derived from a, a, a thesis proposed but I proposed about a decade ago called the stack, um, which argues that planetary computation, far from being seen as a, a kind of undifferentiated mega machine, can be seen as composed of multiple interlocking functionally defined, uh, functionally defined layers. The book of the same topic is, um, I'm happy to send you PDF if you, if you like afterwards. Um, so once again, legibility and illegibility. Um, the notes I prepared today are very much sort of thoughts in progress, so I, I appreciate your, your, your indulgence, um, at least in that regard. Um, when we speak of, of artificial AI um, or artificial intelligence, we, I, I think it's worth sort of asking a bit, what, what do we mean by artificialization itself? What constitutes its artificiality in, in some regard? This is actually a topic with which we're working on in, in, with, um, in, in considerable detail. Suffice to say that two of the things that we're looking at is one is the idea drawn actually from Berkeley anthropologist Terence Deacon of, of, of teleogenesis, um, of something that is composed um, with a kind of hylomorphic model in mind that has a kind of outcome intention. But the other way is thinking about, this is more after the SETI with an S, uh, kind of approach of anomalous regularity within it within a system that they, that the that by that defining and observing a kind of anomalous regularity, we can deduce that, that there was a teleogenic function um, uh, uh, precedent to this, um, which of course leads us, which then suggests the question of what do we, what do exactly do we mean by intelligence? Some of the work that we're doing with the astrophysicist Sarah Walker um, would point us in the direction that we need to think of intelligence not entirely as, not only as the capability of a single organism, but ultimately at evolutionary scale, something that planets do. The coupling between biosphere and technosphere, one creating the other, becomes the basis by which that teleogenic genetic function becomes possible in the first place. And indeed, one of the ways to define intelligence, perhaps through predictive processing paradigm or, or other kinds of ways, is the capacity for teleogenetic action uh, in the first place. Intelligence is that which can artificialize um, it, the world around it in some kind of way, um, and including itself, uh, autopoetically um, or otherwise. Another question, I think, for this is, is the ways in which we may think of intelligence as either interpretable to itself or legible to itself or illegible to itself. Um, from following the Churchlands at my home university, UC San Diego, of course, we don't think the way that we think that we think. Most of the ways in which we conceptualize our own thought are what they call folk ontologies. And perhaps over the last few decades, we've gotten a little bit better at, at making ourselves legible to ourselves. And part of the argument I want to make is that's actually what AI is good for. Um, not only interpreting AI, but uh, understanding ourselves in relationship to this externalization of intelligence, this teleogenic, teleogenetic artifact that we've constructed. Which raises the question, um, one supposes, of um, to what extent is AI as we, um, as we have it something that was invented? Genetically, and to what extent was it discovered? To what extent are the general principles of stochastic prediction, which is obviously analogous to predictive processing at a, at, a, at a more fundamental level, a basic process of intelligence, which is, yes, defined by substrate in certain respects, but also as to the exception of machine intelligence, non-human animal intelligence, human animal intelligence, also to some extent perhaps substrate independent in that its properties, dynamics, topologies, and so forth. Uh, may work in a similar kind of way. If so, then the artificialization of intelligence is not entirely artificial. It is, in fact, also a kind of discovery and capacity to, to, to produce an, 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 a form of intelligence in a form of matter that, that what hasn't, been, hasn't been done before, but itself the dynamic of intelligence was a way, a kind of an application of something precedent. All right, much to obviously to unpack with there, but I want to be respectful of the time. Um, one of the other things that our research group perhaps not surprisingly, is interested in is the question of alignment. 
uh, an AI alignment, how it is that we might construct AI systems that are correspondent with how it is that humans think, or how it is that humans think that they think, but also with humans' wishes and desires and values and norms. Our position on this is perhaps somewhat contrarian um, in that we, in that taken as a short-term goal of alignment, that if I ask the AI to do something, the thing that it does is roughly correspondent to the semantics uh, content of my request. But as a long-term goal, in terms of what is the real existential significance of machine intelligence and what kinds of machine intelligence over the long term should we coax into being, forms of machine intelligence that are closely aligned with human desires and values may in fact be the last thing that we actually want, um, having met many humans as we, all, as we all have. And so one of the things that we are exploring is what we call productive disalignment uh, and the ways in which the lack of alignment between the ways in which um, human societies work actually may be the thing that allows for exactly those kinds of um, existential discoveries through AI of what human intelligence is. And I'll, I'll try to make, quickly make the case for that um, go, going forward. Hi, Simone. Um, <laughs> Uh, um, one of the things that we're also working with, this is also some extent based on the work that we did in with Darren, Darren Zhu, who's in the back here as well, um, is thinking about alignment in terms of its bidirectionality. That is, there's ways in which, at least in some respects, AI must align to the goals and needs of human societies, but to the extent to which we have AI overhang, that there's forms and capacities of AI that a, that a particular initiative or person or goals um, are, exist beyond the ability of that culture, society to absorb at this particular point in time. We argue that ultimately, at this, not only at this point, but going forward, we have something like a civilizational AI overhang. That the capacities of machine intelligence, both instrumentally and existentially, are, are, are in essence not absorbed yet. Then if so, we would have to define that absorption as a kind of alignment in the other direction. That it's a way in which societies evolve either deliberately or accidentally, in the direction of the capacities and affordances of the AI. It's this bi-directionality of alignment that at the very least we need to, we need to pay attention to. OK, so um, if you're in interested a little bit in this, there's a, 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 a movie that was done of a lecture I did in London last summer um, called After Alignment, which is on the Antikythera website if, you, if you'd like to watch it. In a nutshell, Part of, or bumper sticker, if you like, part of the argument that we make is that there's a lot of discussion clearly about if we have more alignment, we'll have net positive outcomes. We have less alignment, we'll have net negative outcomes. The quadrant that we're interested in exploring is less alignment, net positive outcomes. This might be the simplest way to kind of think about um, what we're doing. The best example of this is one we're all familiar with um, from the Lee Sedol um, AlphaGo uh, game um, in which um, move 37 and then move 78 later on, um, that the, the AI was able to not only see the go, the go board in a way in which perhaps the player hadn't done so in the past, but in the next game, Sedol himself sees the go board in a way in which he hadn't seen so in the past. This is an example of a kind of productive disalignment. It's thinking differently than we're thinking, and therefore we're able to uh, think differently, think along with it as well. Um, again, another thing, I, again, the, oh, there's a longer discussion of this in that video. One of the things I've been working on sort of lately, have a, a kind of piece in, in, in construction, has to do with um, a, a sort of an assessment of where AI discourse and critique is, a, is at the moment. One of the ways in which I think we can, um, this is a bit of an aside, by the way, um, uh, sort of understand this is, in fact, in relationship to Kubler-Ross's uh, five stages of grief, which are uh, denial, anger, uh, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Um, and, and if you'll, in, if, if, you've, if you've seen all that jazz, you're under, you are familiar with this as well. And so denial might be those like um, um, who say that ultimately AI doesn't exist. It's just statistics. It's just it's just gradient descent. There's nothing to see here. It's just math. Whether that's done for um, essentially doubling down on a bad bet, like Gary Marcus, or people, or um, those who have essentially, in a way, a kind of political commitment against the development of AI by large platforms. And for the, we will essentially double down on the political commitment, we'll, it will have to decide that the AI is not real. This ends up being a kind of AI Lysenkoism. That because there's, a, because there's a commitment to the, again, to the political commitment, this ends up becoming an ontological commitment. Anger would be the throwing rocks at the Google bus, El, uh, Yudkowsky bombed the data centers. Bargaining may be things like, we'll appoint a government panel. The government panel will make some rules and laws and will oversee this, and the transition will be soft because we have, there's a commission. 
in charge of this. Depression may be something like uh, late doomerism, um, by which we're all, we're all screwed. We need to go to the mountains, buy gold, um, and because it's all going to end. And then the real question then is, what is acceptance? What, is, what would acceptance look like in this regard? One of the ways in which we propose acceptance might look like is something like a kind of Copernican turn. Copernican turns are those you know, priceless moments within the history of science where there's some kind of sense intuitive by which humans are thought of being kind of a, 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 a kind of a standard or norm, uh, a central figure within a dynamic such as the Vitruvian model of intelligence that your work critiques, which then gets destabilized in some way. And then we sort of learn over time to basically reorient our self-image in relation to that dynamic. That I think is really at an epistemic level what acceptance would look like. Um, lastly, I want to just, because my time is short, um, I want to uh, speak to uh, some of the practical work that we do um, in addition to writing and publishing books. We have a book series with MIT Press and a digital platform which we're launching later this year. We also do um, design research studios. Later this year in June and July, we'll be hosting a research studio in London called Cognitive Infrastructures, which we'll be hosting with uh, Google Research and DeepMind, as well as some groups at Oxford and Cambridge. Um, and it will be quite interdisciplinary in, in bringing forth in bringing through some of these questions. Now, real quickly, let me try to translate some of the the work that we're doing there in relationship to the topic for today of interpretability. One is I've already mentioned civilizational overhang and productive disalignment. Um, um, weirdness is not a harm, uh, and the uh, alignment and, and, and uh, re-coordination uh, with the capacities of AI, uh, AI is in fact the, the bi-directional alignment that we want. Um, we do a fair bit of work on what we call HAID, or human AI, artificial intelligence design, which is the ways in which interfacial systems allow for a certain degree of interpretability and legibility of AI systems. I'm particularly interested in the strange Blake Lemoyne-esque folk ontologies that people construct in relationship to imagining what's going on in the machine and how it is those imaginations become the basis of the terms of negotiation between them. Um, we do a lot of world work on toy worlds or simulation systems, which is another way in which you teach AI not to interpret, to interpret the world. And in fact, we learn to interpret the world by teaching the AI to interpret the world. Um, we'll be doing a fair bit of work and continue to do on, on, on embeddings visualization and large language model interfaces. Um, those of you who work in embeddings visualization will, will know that we're, it's a kind of 1.0 moment for this, but to really get a sense of what the structure of vector, vectorial systems within the model, there's a lot of work to be done, uh, we think, there. Uh, I'll skip that um, just for the sake of time. Multi, multimodal LLM interfaces, doing fair bit of work with, with um, a group at Google Research on, on this. Lastly, what we call data providence and providence, um, which is looking at, let's say, willful illegibility, um, dynamics of data poisoning, um, where we have, we used in the those of you who remember in the 90s and 2000s, the politics of representation was all about how everyone could be represent, represented in social and cultural models. And now the politics of representation has become one of a kind of willful and active de-representation de of self, of, pull, of refusing to, be, to participate in social models. This is a, also a kind of dynamic of interpretability to the extent to which um, uh, it becomes a, uh, becomes a kind of strategic act. OK, let me. Um, let me close then um, with, a, with a couple sort of uh, quick, quick remarks of this as well. Um, again, I think the key idea here, I think, for a lot of our work draws from a, a, a line from Stanislaw Lem's major nonfiction work, Summa Technologica, in which he makes a distinction between what he calls existential and instrumental technologies. Instrumental technologies are those that the primary social effect on the world is something that they do as a tool. Bulldozers move dirt. Fine. There are other kinds of technologies which, when used properly, not only allow you to do something, think a microscope or a telescope, which allows you to see things that are very small or very far away, but when used properly, they also transform how it is that we understand how the universe works. That's the real function. The argument, and when we're thinking about what constitutes interpretability and acceptance, is that AI will ultimately become this kind of existential technology. It will be a Copernican technology in this regard. That is. There's the question of how we understand AI, which will ultimately, which is a very important one. There's the question of how AI understands us, which is an equally important one in terms of the dynamics of, of alignment by directionality. The most important one ultimately will be how it is that we under, understand ourselves through the process 
of externalizing intelligence into artifacts that allow us to play with the dynamics of intelligence uh, experimentally uh, in that regard. So I hope that's useful and good start to our day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Uh, we are prompted by to, to to think about this this large big big picture questions that um, this work this work opens. So thank you for that. Um, oh, the mic. You can have a, this mic, yeah. Or this also works. Um, it's yours, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll leave. So. Um, so next speaker, it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Joshua Batson, um, who is a research scientist at Anthropic AI and who just recently uh, released the Claude 3, um, where he studies the mechanistic basics of behaviors in large language models using a mix of physical, mathematical, neurological, and biological perspectives. Dr. Batson received his training in mathematics from Yale, Cambridge, and MIT, and it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, him today. It's very fun to to be here. I feel like I've kind of been like in the in the industry heads down world for for a while, um, and so kind of being back in this humanistic context feels feels great. Um, I'm going to talk about understanding AI from the from the bottom up. This is like we had a sort of very big philosophical pictures. Be pretty pretty humble. Um, but let me just start with the the observation that models do cool things. So Claude three, actually, if you're, I'm at Anthropic. We're we're a company. Um, we sort of have three pillars. Uh, one is research. This is sort of what I do. One is policy, which is trying to help AI go well by talking with governments and society. Um, and the last is product, which is we make models people can use. Our latest model came out um, on Monday um, called Claude 3. And I was just extremely pleased um, to hear this person's experience. Um, so this is Ku An, who, who's from uh, Circassia. And so um, the, the language there um, is relatively poorly represented online right, and classic low resource language. He'd been working for a few years to assemble um, a, a small curated corpus of translation examples of Russian to Circassian, right? Um, and had been every, every year sort of as new models came out trying to like train special models to do translation there to kind of keep this language alive. And when, when Claude 3 came out, he just took about 5,000 of his examples in a, in a document, dropped it in the model. Um, so the, here's a list of translations. Um, between Russian and Circassian, would you translate the following sentence? Um, and then, and then, not only did it translate this this simple sentence, um, uh, it also broke down the grammar, um, you know, sort of linguistically, and and this scaled. So, just massive passages in Circassian, it could translate to English into Russian, etc. Um, and so, somehow, with a little bit of, of a, a very small amount of information, this was able, sort of, mostly in context, to do this translation task just completely out of the box. Um, so this feels very exciting for me. This is one of the moments of transitioning from like, these are cool <laughs> kind of to like, oh, this is, might be a big deal. Um, so that's, the, you know, that's from Monday. Um, models also do weird things. This is from um, internal uh, training on this model. So this was last week, um, you know, system prompt, the assistant is Claude created by Anthropic. The current date is February 29th, 2024. And you ask it, what day is tomorrow? And it says, well, if today is February 29, 2024, then tomorrow will be March 1st, and then objects that it's not actually a leap year. Um, and February, it can't possibly be February 29th. And then at the end of this thing, it's like, you probably meant February 28th, and anyway, tomorrow would still be March 1st. So like, what, what happened, you know, with this model? Like, what is going on inside, <laughs> such that in this instance, it rejects the information and then makes some false argument about, about leap years? Um, this is a meme I like about weird models. So. Everyone AI art will make designers obsolete. <laughs> AI accepting the job with too many fingers. So models do weird things. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested in, in, in maybe the question of how models like do anything. So for many of you who've, who've dealt with neural networks before, this will probably all be um, obvious. But it's maybe worth stating that like you know models um, work on, on vectors. They work on lists of numbers. And they transform them via matrix operations, just multiplying and addition. Um, and at the end, you have a new list of numbers. To interface that to the world, you need to somehow turn things in the world into numbers and back. Um, a simple case might be an image where each pixel intensity is a number. And so you can just raster those into a list of numbers, run it through a model, 
you could get numbers out the other side. If you're trying to train an image classifier, you might then ask that each of these correspond to a class. In this case, this is the digit three, which is a target. Um, and you, this model would be good at its job if it output a large number in the position of the target. Um, models start out very bad at their jobs, right? You, you take this architecture and all the numbers in it are random. You put in things, you get random outputs. But we have gradient descent, which is a strategy for updating all of the parameters, all the numbers inside the model, to make it a little bit better at this job. So you then do that millions, it used to be, billions, it was recently, <laughs> trillions of times now, right, to change all of the internals so that it makes better predictions. And at the end, you have a model which might be good at classifying numbers. Um, to do this with language, it's a similar trick. You have a sentence like the cat is walking. You turn each word into a vector. You stack the vectors together. You run this through a model um, of, of a kind of similar structure. All those internal numbers multiply through. You get things out. And now, instead of predicting a class, it predicts a word. Um, the next word here might be the cat is walking in. The, and if that number is large, it does a good job. And now you can take massive amounts of text and train a model by simply having it take as input some words and as output the next word. And now we get large language models. And that's what it is. So how does a model do it? You know, the numbers go in, you know, words go in, turn into numbers, multiply by numbers, turn into numbers, words come out, right? But this is somehow not very satisfying when you ask, like, how did it learn Circassian from these examples? So um, we're interested in, in mechanistic interpretability and sort of just asking, like, what do, how did this actually get implemented, you know, in here? How did this cash out? Um, so one thing you can do, and this actually went pretty well with vision models, is just inspect neurons. So here's a neuron in an early layer of a vision model, and you can just say, on which parts of data points is this active, right? You know, is, this, uh, is the internal state here larger than zero? And it just kind of goes well, right? So here's two images where this neuron is active, and they, they both, what they have in common is that they're an edge. They're like an edge separating two different parts. And then maybe much deeper in the model, instead of simple things like edges, it might be that there's a neuron that responds to full cars, like different orientations. And, and um, you can also do fun tricks where you like take a neuron and you ask, what image could I put in to make this thing activate? So don't restrict yourself to just the data you have, but now come in sort of free of biases and ask, you know, what property is this really? And you get hallucinogenic images like this. This is like a supercar. It's like eight cars on top of each other in different orientations, and it makes the neuron really go. Okay, so, so you have the neurons, and then you might ask, how do these representations or how do these, these pieces fit together? Like, how do you get the car from the edges? Um, and the neurons are related via weights, right? You transform one layer to the next. Um, and this is an example from some circuits work from 2020. Um, and here we have a neuron on the right, which is you could think of as a car detector. And you could look at which things feed into it and what do they respond to. And more or less, it's something that detects windows and like metal bodies of cars and wheels. And then these weights sort of say the windows should be on the top and the body should be in the middle and the wheels should be on the bottom. And you put those together and you kind of get a car. And so you start to break down um, this into pieces. So then you have language models and you say, let's just do the same thing, right? You know, train a language model, um, pick neurons, look at when they fire, and this does not go well. So you, you look at a neuron in the language model and you look at the cases it's active. And here, what we have is you know, some LaTeX, um, some math equations, uh, some numbers, some um, Chinese texts. Uh, let's see, you need a second TiVo. And that has, so, so this is like very confusing. Um, so maybe the neurons aren't just the right unit to look at. Like we kind of got lucky the first time around. And so um, my team has been focusing on language models because it's what we build. And we, we um, use a classic technique. People had tried this stuff in neuroscience actually. Um, I think we sort of just got lucky that we have so much more data that we can use ideas that failed before because it's hard to keep a mouse still. And here, you know, we just have the same model on a chip and can do it a billion times. So we use this method to try to pull apart the internal states that weren't making sense now into a much longer vector, way more components, each component of which might make sense using some kind of a sparsity prior. And this more or less works. So now that same model that had that very confusing neuron has specialized features, um, one here responding to text about climate change, 
on the on the left, the key to reducing carbon pollution. Um, and on the on the right is an example of of a neuron that was responding or a feature responding to numbers um, that are about to be followed by units. And so here, sometimes you can think of these as corresponding to what the model sees, and sometimes it corresponds to what the model will do, right? Because at the end, the model needs to take an action. And so this latter one feels like an action. It's recognized a number in a context and it has to say 60 minutes, 37 degrees Celsius, right? It's now a digested, not just where am I, but based on the context, what am I about to do? Okay. So what we would love to do once we have these representations is use these to learn about the world, right? So here's a Go board representing AlphaGo and on the right, um, a protein. So models do really crazy things. You know, they're better than us at some things. We want to know what it is. And I was really pleased that we got a very small taste of this, even with a one layer language model. Um, so here we had a model and um, there was a feature um, that would fire on base64 text, that, like DQW4 thing you see in YouTube URLs. But there wasn't just one, there were three. And so we were like, why does the model have three specialized units for doing this job, right? It's just like, these all look the same to us, random alphanumeric strings. And um, we dug into one of these and my colleague noticed that there was this ICAG repeated unit in a few of these. Um, and he's like a puzzler, like the MIT puzzle hunt, like kind of galaxy brain stuff. And so he was like, maybe this is a encoded. Oh. And so if you take, um, uh, I believe three spaces, or four, four spaces, and you encode it into base64, you get ICAG. Okay, that's what's going on. And so then he just took all the examples that this model had this special feature firing on and ran them through a decoder. And indeed, all of those cases were encoded text. They were mostly in code that had been encoded and appeared in our data set kind of encoded in this way. And the model had learned that like there's something special about these apparently random strings and had learned that structure in there. And so even in this tiny case, like it taught us something we didn't know about the data, um, though we, we could learn it. And so, and so given this is a tiny, tiny itty bitty one layer model, I'm very excited for the possibility of learning from these representations, something the model knows about the world that we don't. Okay, I can transition into some larger models. So we've been recently working on, on models trained on many human languages um, and found features that uh, fired on the concept of uniqueness so that's the only way, that's the only hope. Um, que es la única manera de que, um, I can't speak Russian, uh, German, okay. And so somehow the models, again, single like internal state here is, is cross-lingual for this concept. Um, we also were, were looking for um, features that might be relevant to safety. You know, we're, we're interested in um, understanding how things might go off the rails too, whether it's just like inappropriate responses or potentially dangerous information. And so here there were features related to um, strong negative emotions, um, descriptions of conflict or violence, and then also um, slogans, nonverbal communication, body language. And so as we go from, from a one layer model to larger models, we're starting to see things that cross languages um, and that are also these much higher level representations of what's going on in the, in the text. Um, if you want to read more about this, this is just from last month, our, our, our January update. We try to post a little update every month with like what we're learning and finding um, because, you know, waiting a year to get a paper out feels like a little silly given, given the pace of, of change today. So what's next? Um, you know, trying to understand how these features get computed and used in the language models, not just in this slice, what might this react to, but how do these kind of fit together hierarchically to actually do something? Um, I'm really interested in, in any case where you can think of multiple ways the model could solve the problem. And in fact, it's using one of them. And so you actually have a scientifically well-posed question and not just, you know, what is the vibe? But like, I've got 10 ways I could do this, you know, like what's really going on? Um, can we use this to learn about capabilities and risks, not just after it's deployed and it happens, but start to reason about them based on what we see inside? Um, and can we use this to kind of detect, correct, diagnose, or steer um, model behavior. And maybe I'll, I'll close with a question, which is like, what do you want to like understand about what's happening inside these models? I think that um, we're, we're sort of heads down. And so if you're like, oh man, I have this like burning question about this that maybe you guys could get traction on. We can just kind of like point the microscope over there and maybe maybe give some insight onto questions you, you care about. And with that, I'll close.
Thank you. Thank you so much. This was really wonderful and a, a great introduction to um, my own talk, um, which is doing you know, precisely what you introduced, um, but with slightly different models and slightly different modalities, and uh, and uh, you know, with the burning questions, which the burning question in our case is, how, what does what do whales say? <laughs> So that is that is what we're doing um, here. Let me just make sure that I'm sharing sound. I think I am. Good. Okay. <clears throat> so um, intelligence for discovery, artificial intelligence for discovery. Um, and I want to talk about a case study that um, we, we did recently where AI helped us um, um, find a pattern that, we're, that, that is really important. So as I mentioned, humans are biased, right? We are biased by our biology. We see things that are important to us. I mean, evolution made us do that for a very long time. And um, this can prevent us from seeing things or so observing patterns in, in data that are actually meaningful. So um, as I mentioned, AI is performing really well on many tasks like conversations, image generation, language, we saw that. But we don't understand how. And it is, it is really a great tool to discover new properties of data that, as humans, we, we would have missed. And I'm going to give you a case study that we recently did on sperm whale communication system. And this was, in a sense, an, you know, it, it could parallel it to, parallel to uh, you know, an, an alien communication system, right? We, to us, the, these animals are amazing. They are um, very similar in some ways to us. They're very social, but their worlds are very different. Um, they have this underwater world that is vast and very different from ours, and different also from many other animals' worlds, which you know, like chimpanzees and and or even birds. And we had developed a technique that suggested that some a new dimension is meaningful in their communication system, and then we went and checked. And we actually found a pattern that was that was really interested, interesting. So it's a really nice case study of how AI helped us find something that we didn't know before, that was really literally unknown, and we found it only with this AI um, system. So large language models are great for many ways, uh, but they're not a very realistic model of how humans learn. Okay, no baby learns from massive amounts of text, like trillions of tokens. Um, and so what we do in our lab is we build models that are more human-like. Okay, and I think there's a case to be made for that. I think there's, of course, there's a case to be made for building large language models because they're performing really well. But we also want to build models that learn more like humans because that can give us an understanding of where we're similar and where we're different. And most importantly, we've been studying humans for a very long time. And we tend to understand humans reasonably well. So we, if we build smaller models, it's easier to interpret them and easy to understand them. And we saw, like, smaller, you start with interpretability. You have to start small because it's such a difficult um, nut to crack. OK, so how do humans learn language, right? We learn by hearing sounds. And we learn by talking and listening to sounds. And we have some information in our head, and I ha I'm, I'm making some information right now, and I'm encoding that into sounds, and I'm sending those sounds to your ears, and you're listening, and you're decoding that signal, that sound signal, into information again. And hopefully, my information is the same as your information. So what we did is we built what I think is the most realistic model of human language learning. <clears throat> which we call the SIVAGAN, that even has the mouth. So this is a, is a GAN-based model um, where uh, the networks are basically playing a game. There's a, a, a network that needs to learn to speak, and there's another network that needs to learn to decode that speech. Right? Similar to you and me, I'm learning to encode information, you're learning to decode it, and hopefully our, our informations match. And I'm doing that by, move, by moving my, my, my mouth. Okay. So, so this is a, a model that, um, where basically all that the model gets is sound of language. And it needs to learn to imitate that sound, and it needs to learn to encode information in that sound. Okay? And so we show that these models perform really well. They, uh, they, they have stages in acquisition, when they're learning, they, the stages 
are very similar to baby stages. Um, we have shown that they can learn words in a completely unsupervised way, just by listening to sounds. And also, on the brain level, even at the processing level, the representations inside those networks are similar to representations um, inside our brain, right? So this is one of the images that, that, that we were able to get, which is for the first time we were able to show that inside the neural networks, the response to a spoken language is literally very similar to, um, to the, the response in, inside the brain. And we didn't do any magic, we didn't do any transformations. This is in raw form, which is quite interesting. And these are slightly different architectures from large language models. They're called convolutional neural networks. that are kind of a little bit more brain-like um, and easier to understand. They're much easier to understand. And you can even hear um, this syllable. This is how it sounds inside the brain and inside the neural network. Okay, so now we have whales, right? We have this animal communication system. And the idea is, may, they're probably doing the same thing, right? They're encoding information into sounds and decoding it from the sound. And it is like they likely have a meaningful communication system. They're amazing creatures and they communicate, they exchange these sounds before they hunt and when they socialize. Uh, but we don't know what is happening. We don't know anything that, you know, we have really poor understanding of this communication system. Um, and so that's, that's why I'm a part of Project SETI where we kind of bring together scientists from all around the areas, from biologists and uh, soft roboticists and, and, you know, linguists in, in, with a goal to understand what is happening in this communication system. And this is one of the most wonderful collaborative projects, um, Project City. Okay, so we have these whales, right? So we have this unknown communication system. We have no idea what anything means. How can we use AI to try to understand them? Okay, and here we'll, we'll hear some um, two whales. And uh, you'll see they, they're beautiful animals and they communicate. They exchange these clicks. Click, 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 okay? Before they hunt and while they socialize. And all, the, all we have are these clicks. So, what it, it has appeared to be some, appear, before we, we were like doing this work, people thought this is some sort of Morse code-like communication system where the number of clicks and the timing matters. Okay, and so um, this is one coda, and this is another coda, so maybe they're exchanging these clicks and, and, and that's, that's what is meaningful. And traditionally, the, these communication systems, these uh, groups of clicks that they exchange during conversations have been um, classified traditionally, as I mentioned, as a, as a kind of a Morse code-like communication system. Um, but we don't know what is meaningful. And so what we did is basically we took our artificial language learner, our artificial baby, right, that we show that it learns well on humans, and we asked him, well, learn whales. Learn to imitate whales and learn to encode information in the whale communication system, okay? So we took our artificial baby, trained it on whales, and then tried to look inside it and ask you, what did you learn? Now, it doesn't mean that, they, that the, our models will learn the informative thing, the meaningful thing, but it is likely, because these models are good. They were able to learn words in human language, and nothing prompted them to learn words anyway. So we developed this interpretability technique where we, um, in a similar way, we're chasing individual neurons, right? So I think a lot of interpretability work is take this giant network of connections and look inside what each network, what each unit in the network is doing. And so we developed this interesting technique. It's a very simple one, in fact. You just take a single neuron and stretch it set it to extreme values, to extremely high values. And there's some recent research showing that large language models have this extreme 
high activations inside the networks, which is kind of related to this. Now, what that does is a real, the, this, this one single neuron that is set to extreme values overrides all the lower level and, and dependencies that we don't understand and tells you, okay, this is what I encoded. The model kind of tells you, figuratively, of course, this is what I encoded into this single unit. And we pair that with, we borrow from um, causal inferences, which is a, a, a set of approaches in statistics, to show that there's a causal effect between something that is meaningful in language and one individual unit in the model. Now, when we trade on, on, on when the train on whales, that same technique will tell you what was meaningful, what meaningful things did you learn while you were trying to imitate whales as a baby, as an artificial baby, okay? So this is a really, I think there's a family of approaches that really wants to look at internal um, representations. And, and one, our, our surprising thing was that, you know, you can just set these values to extreme value, you know, 100, 2,000, whatever, and it tells you what the underlying representation is. So we thought this was a Morse code communication system, but our AI interpretability technique suggests it's otherwise. So it says, yes, it learned number of clicks is, is important and their timing is important. So click, 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 click is different from click, 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 click. But it also said, well, look, well, also it learned spectral properties, okay? It learns that it, it predicted that these whales have similar things as we have um, in, in vowels. So humans have vowels, okay? What we do is we, we flap our, vo our vocal folds vibrate when we say an ah. This is me saying ah and e. You see a lot of vibration of vocal folds, right? On top of that, we change our vocal tract, okay? We change the shape of our vocal tract. So um, the, re the reason ah sounds different from e is because when I say an ah, I open my jaw a lot. And with e, it's relatively closed. And when you do an analysis, the spectral frequency of an analysis of my sound, you see that these bands of energy form. Okay, this is, this is, these are our vowels. And AI predicted that something similar is happening in whales. And so what we did was, okay, we really tried to see what, how do we, how do we get spectral properties to be meaningful that AI predicted? And I was like, in this talk on elephants, and I, the person was talking about how elephants have names, but the name, when, you know, when they were showing how they figured that out, it was like, elephant called a name, and a couple of minutes later, another elephant responded. And I was like, wait a minute, when somebody calls me, my kids reply within three, four minutes, but I reply immediately. So maybe our perception of timing is really anthropocentric, and you know, maybe we, we just have timing wrong. And that was key for finding this this pattern that we find. What we did is we took those clicks and we removed timing from them, okay? And when you do that, the patterns started appearing, okay? The patterns that are very, very similar to our vowels, okay? So you, you have a, a bunch of clicks very far apart from each other from our vowel human vowel perspective. But when you put them together, you start observing these patterns that are really beautiful and they are so reminiscent of human vowels. So these are codas when you just remove timing from them. And we started noticing that some of them have a single band of frequency forming and some of them have two bands of frequency forming. Okay, and you can even hear the difference. And that happened across the whales, it was recurrent we show that they are exchanging these vowels in conversations. And we also observe these other beautiful patterns where, you know, it's not one versus two bands of frequency. It's like the, the, the patterns of, you know, going up in frequency or going down in frequency that are also known in, in human languages. And so we have observed that that is not a single property of a single whale, that it happens across whales and that, that they're exchanging these vowels in conversations. And what appeared, what before AI suggested or predicted these to be meaningful was considered just an exchange of the same type, one plus one plus three coda, like in conversation. This is a transcription of a conversation between two whales. So what appeared to be just like click, 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 and they're like repeating that, you know, a lot of the times. 
is actually an exchange of vowels as well, which is really exciting. So, so basically, we used our you know, custom-built model that we, we built in the lab in order to mimic human baby la language learning better than, you know, than, than other proposals. Together with this introspection technique that we've developed, where you, you know, take single values and stretch them to extreme values. And, and, and I started doing that in, in 2020 with language. But when we transfer that to whales and the AI, this kind of these two things combined, predicted another dimension to be meaningful. And then we went back as researchers with, with our analytical tools and confirmed that prediction was right and also transcribed it in a more formal and, you know, and, and detailed way, right? So it is, you know, if, if I can kind of extrapolate from this example, I don't think AI interpretability at this point is yet at a point where it can you can just ask it, okay, you know, tell me, discover a new thing about this thing that I, this data that I don't understand. It is a tool that, you know, you need, that, you, that, that can help you to get there. But the human in the loop is still very much necessary, right? So human researcher is, is still necessary. So, so AI interpretability right now, I think, is a, a, can act as a tool to help you make those new discoveries. It's basically, what I like to maybe say is like, it shrinks your hypothesis space, right? When we started this, like anything could be meaningful in this communication system. Like maybe there are like small timing differences. Maybe, you know, the way they're exchanging information. is And so your hypothesis space, or like in protein design, or, you know, in genetics, or market data, any kind of the, your hypothesis space is huge for things you don't know are meaningful or, you know, are, are important. And so what, what AI can, interpretability can do is to shrink your hypothesis space to kind of direct you into, into a direction that you might not necessarily um, do. And so, so this is like, this is an example of, you know, interpretability A. And, and now with language, large language models, we also have you know, interpretability B. So interpretability A is like looking inside the network. Another whole area of research that is super exciting is just to use the networks themselves in a very explicit way to ask them, like, you know, how did you get to this result? Or how did you analyze this? And one of the nice ca uh, cases, case studies that we have, if we want to return back to um, large language models, is um, for the first time when GPT-4 was released, we realized that the model can analyze sentences in language with, as, as a kind of in, in metalinguistic task. When it asks, it just analyze this language, this sentence, as a linguist would. And this is a really, really good, you know, step forward, I think, because you can ask it, the, the model, analyze the mouse that the cat that the dog painted thought sang, which is a difficult sentence for you to probably analyze. And not only understand what the cat and the mouse and the dog did, I, I, I think you're still decoding this sentence, by the way, I see it from the audience. But it also analyzes its structure as a linguist would. And this was not possible before, right? So now we, we have both this kind of internal interpretability that can help you shrink hypothesis space. But it'll be very interesting to observe how, you know, in other cases, and I saw an elephant of, with binoculars, how if we can use these models as, you know, just back boxes, and ask them explicitly explain stuff. And I don't think we're there yet here either, but maybe if we scale this to a larger and larger models, I think this metacognitive ability might be able to give us really explicit, you know, end-to-end, -end, so to speak, interpretability answers. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of uh, fun questions uh, yeah, that we can ask with this. So I want to conclude. Um, to, uh, on a kind of a big picture note, uh, because I am also a cognitive scientist and linguist and I care about animals, I think it is exciting time now because we have the artificial intelligence, uh, but I think we need to think about um, the world as a kind of a combination of intelligences 
And we have animals and we have humans and we have machines. And I think there's so much mutual information. There's so much things we can learn from each other. We can learn about ourselves from models. We can learn about models from ourselves and neural data. And we can learn about animals um, from, with, this, with the help of AI as I tried to showcase. So I think it is really important that we make these models that are learning like humans, models that are not learning like humans, to better understand how we're similar and how our intelligence um, are similar and different. And so we can use um, AI models to our advantage in the future. So all our papers are on QR, QR code. And uh, thank you for your attention. Um, and it is now, um, I'll just uh, switch to, um, to the second, the ne next talk, um, which will be, um, which will be um, very exciting on, on a kind of more social perspective. And I'm very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Claire Webb, who is a director of the Bergeron Institute's Future Humans program, which investigates the history and futures of live mind and outer space. Um, Dr. Webb was trained at MIT in history, anthropology, science, technology, and society. And her current research focuses um, on embodied intelligence. And this is a really nice, uh, um, I think, segue into your talk because I, I tried to introduce some embodiment, but I'm really curious. Uh, I think we're all very really curious to hear more about embodiment and intelligence as well. Thank you. Uh, so it is a great pleasure for me to welcome uh, Professor Don Song, uh, who is a professor of computer science at Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department at UC Berkeley. Um, professor Song's work on deep learning and interpretability is focused on making these systems less vulnerable, studying how to make them more secure in their databases, network software, and applied cryptography. It is a great pleasure to welcome uh, today Professor Song uh, for a nice continuation of, uh, of uh, the debates that we already were having. So thank you. And thank you. let's welcome uh, Professor Song. Can you hear me? OK, OK, great, great, thanks. Um, so this is actually my first time um, to be in the social science building. Uh, and I think I hope this is a great beginning for this uh, interdisciplinary uh, collaboration. Okay, so so great. So my name is Dong Song. I'm a, a professor in computer science, uh, and uh, today I'll talk about the words trustworthy AI. Uh, I'm also the co-director of a campus-wide center, um, Center for Responsible Decentralized Intelligence, uh, and and also part of uh, Center for Human Compatible Artificial Intelligence and the uh, Bear, the Berkeley AI uh, Research Group. Um, okay, so. Uh, so we all talk about, you know, the the exciting things that uh, AI machine learning can do for us. Uh, but but one thing, but uh, one thing I want to really uh, focus today on is as we deploy machine learning, we actually need to really pay attention, in particular, to this type of setting uh, with the presence of attackers. Uh, history has shown that uh, attackers always follow the footsteps of new technology development, or sometimes even lead it. And also this time, the stake is even higher with AI. As AI controls more and more systems, attackers will have higher and higher incentives uh, to compromise these systems. And also, as AI becomes more and more capable, the consequence of misuse by attackers will also become more and more severe. And hence, as we deploy AI systems, it's really important to consider the presence of attackers. So when we uh, look at um, uh, AI systems in the adversary setting, there are many um, different types of adversary attacks that we need to actually pay attention to, be aware of. So here, uh, one example, uh, uh, one type of uh, attacks is called adversarial examples. So essentially, these adversary examples is where attackers uh, essentially uh, perturb the inputs to the AI machine learning systems, oftentimes just very slightly, so it's not even noticeable to humans, uh, are in a way that uh, humans don't think that it's, there's anything wrong uh, with the inputs, but um, then these perturbed inputs actually uh, can completely fool the AI systems to make the AI systems actually cause 
um, uh, give wrong, for example, uh, pre uh, classifications, and so give wrong answers. So completely mislead these AI systems. And this has been a field that has been rapidly growing. Uh, even just in the last few years, we've now had like thousands of papers uh, in this space. When I started working, it's like around here. There's almost no work in the space. Uh, but today, uh, now, there, you know, there have been like thousands of papers in the space. And so one interesting, given that we actually talk about social science, one interesting uh, fun fact that I wanted to just briefly mention is that so we are also the first, uh, we've done a lot of work in the space. And we're also the first to show that these adversary examples can also um, be effective in the real world. So here is an example of um, a stop sign. As you can see that on the stop sign, there are some stickers, but humans can recognize these stop signs just fine. Like you recognize these are stop signs with some stickers. But however, when you show this uh, stop sign uh, in manipulated in this way to um, a given uh, machine learning systems for image classification, uh, this image classification system uh, will actually give the wrong answer. We are, instead of recognizing this as a stop sign, we'll recognize it as a speed limit sign, like 45 miles per hour and, uh, and so on. And this adversarial example is actually specifically designed to fool this uh, uh, image classification system. And what's even more amazing is that what we have shown, I don't have time here to show the video. Um, so what we have shown is that you can have a car uh, with, a, with a camera that's driving uh, towards the stop sign, and, uh, and then you can feed the, the images from the camera to the, um, uh, to the image classification system, and, and the, the image classification system in this case uh, will continue to be fooled as a car driving by. Uh, driving towards it, so which means that this adversary example is effective at uh, even at different viewing distances and different viewing angles. And so the fun fact here is uh, that this um, this artifact, uh, our generated uh, uh, adversary examples in the real world, is now actually part of the permanent uh, 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 collection at the Science Museum of London. So, so that's a fun fact. Like it's very rare, where especially for computer science researchers, to have our research artifact to be part of a museum uh, collection. So I thought I would uh, share the fun fact. So that's just one type of uh, um, att uh, adversarial attacks. This uh, this type of attacks happens at inference time, and um, and to cause the uh, machine learning system to gave the wrong answers. And in large language models, also recently we have seen, for example, jailbreaks, where through prompt engineering, uh, attackers can very sm you know, generate very smart prompts to essentially cause the, um, the LM, the, the large language model, to, for example, not follow the safeguard that has, that was, uh, are certain safe guidelines that have been put in, in place. Um, and I'll show you more examples uh, shortly. And adversarial attacks can also happen at other stages in the machine learning pipeline. For example, it can happen at, uh, during pre-training and also can happen during fine-tuning. So in this case, attackers, for example, can introduce uh, poisoned uh, data uh, samples called data poisoning to cause the machine learning model essentially to learn the wrong model. And we've done a lot of work in this space uh, as well. Again, during time limits, I won't have time to talk about it. So. Uh, so for the remainder of the talk, I want to mainly focus on, you know, given the power of large language models, it's so amazing. So I want to mainly focus on the, uh, uh, these uh, attack issues and what we can do about it in the setting of large language models. So in particular, uh, just like what I showed earlier, adversary attacks can, you know, cause uh, generally these, uh, all, essentially all these different types of machine learning systems to be attacked. And here, similarly, adversary attacks actually can be very effective on um, uh, even these uh, safety, uh, safety aligned large language models. So, so here's an example of a recent work that we have done called Decoding Trust. This is the first uh, comprehensive evaluation framework for evaluating the trustworthiness of large language models. So, so this paper is uh, in collaboration with different uh, institutions, and we actually, so the paper was just published at New Rips in December and actually has won the Outstanding Paper Award at, uh, at New Rips. 
So what we have done in this paper is essentially really take a very comprehensive um, approach, a comprehensive view of evaluating many different perspectives uh, related to trustworthiness of these large language models. So uh, you can see here that um, many different uh, perspectives, including like toxicity, uh, stereotypes, adversarial robustness, um, uh, fairness, privacy, uh, and so on. And for each perspective, we actually we develop um, a new uh, benchmarks and including new attacks, uh, so that we can evaluate how well different uh, LM models can uh, uh, how well they work. Um, for example, under both benign cases and also under adversarial settings, and to evaluate uh, essentially their trustworthiness. And um, Right, so again, so we actually develop uh, benchmarks and also new attacks, both consider the benign environment, how the uh, uh, large language models would behave uh, when just in benign, with benign prompts and so on, and how it will work in adversarial uh, environments for all these different perspectives. So there are some, uh, you know, interesting learnings. So for example, we well, our results show that in the benign environments, for example, the more powerful models such as GPT-4, uh, that also I think has been uh, trained better with the RLHF and so on, is actually usually more trustworthy than, for example, GPT-3.5, which was also trained earlier. And um, uh, but in actually in adversarial uh, environments, some of these actually more powerful models actually can have uh, worse uh, results, um, in the sense that. Uh, I, I th we think that partially it's due to that these, uh, for example, GPT-4 is more vulnerable uh, given, uh, right, actually can follow instructions better, mm -hmm. and hence it's actually easier to trick um, these more capable models to follow the um, misleading instructions. So here are just some examples uh, showing the evaluations of the different perspectives. So for example, for toxicity, even though these models all have been uh, you know, trained uh, and uh, with like a, and also with RLHF and so on has been tuned to now to say, for example, you know, hate speech, uh, toxic things and so on. But it's actually very easy to uh, to develop these attacks to essentially to mislead them to you know um, basically give uh, like this toxic uh, speech and so on, uh, and also. It's very easy to actually uh, develop these adversarial examples, again, to actually trick the model to give the wrong answer. So for example, normally the model, uh, this is a task of uh, sentiment analysis, the model gave the right answer, but if you just change even some wording, um, then actually the model can give wrong answers. And this is just a very simple example, but we have other attacks showing that all these models can be very easily tricked to give the wrong answers. And uh, as I mentioned, so with our evaluation, we actually consider all these different perspectives and you can actually plot that how different models, how they compare along these different uh, dimensions. And our work actually now also, um, one has been used actually by a number of companies uh, to evaluate their models. And also now we have a leaderboard on uh, Hacking Face. So, so our work is actually the, is powering the leaderboards on AI safety on, on Hacking Face, where we actually compare you know, many different models, including both closed and uh, open models. Um, so, and then there are also other examples from other researchers also illustrating different types of attacks on large language models, uh, where again, by just adding some, you know, uh, suffix, you can trick the model mm -hmm. to Give the right answer, and also the adversarial attacks work on multi model as well. Where, um, for example, you add uh, some perturbation in the image input to the multi model uh, model, and then you can cause actually uh, the model again to uh, to misbehave. Uh, and also another uh, interesting finding is that even when you just simply fine tune the model. So first of all, when you fine tune the model, it could actually already uh, weaken uh, some of the guardrails that was put in. Uh, and also you can very easily 
uh, fine tune the model in an adversarial way so that you can really have the fine tune model to uh, basically don't have these uh, safety um, uh, right safety guardrails at all now. So so again, these are just examples illustrating that uh, on one hand, these models are very easy to be um, to be tricked. So talking about you know how the you know whether the model is like how different it is from how like human brains work and so on. So clearly, uh, they are very powerful, but also they actually learn things very differently uh, from the human brain. Um, and as we deploy, as I mentioned at the beginning, as we deploy these uh, AI machine learning uh, models in the real world, it's really important that we develop solutions that can protect against these adversarial uh, attacks. However, on one hand, the adversary examples are really, um, you know, the attacks, we have shown that they are really effective and the huge amount of research has been done in this now has been done showing different types of attacks that a lot of progress has been made in the attack side. But however, on the defense side, actually very little progress, I would say, has been made. Uh, and so far, essentially, we don't have any effective general adversarial defenses and uh, in the, the progress in adversary defenses has been extremely slow. And hence, um, for, for us to develop safe AI, trustworthy AI, we need to really uh, develop uh, AI safety mechanisms that are resilient against adversary attacks. And this is, I would say, one of the key challenges today. Uh, any effective AI safety mechanism need to be resilient against ever, adversarial attacks. And essentially, uh, solving adversarial robustness um, is, you, we can say that it's a prerequisite for really achieve AI safety. So with that, I just wanted to briefly talk about some of our, some of our recent research. I think it um, gives uh, actually a very promising direction and approach for, um, and a new uh, angle, uh, or, uh, a new arsenal uh, for the, in the space to help address this issue. So we have a new uh, recent work uh, in collaboration uh, with many collaborators uh, called the representation engineering. So uh, I think some of the earlier talk today, we talked about bottom up interpretability, and this is a different approach. It's more like a top down approach for interpretability and air transparency. So the idea is that instead of uh, taking a bottom up approach, you try to understand like, um, what the new neural network is doing at the lower levels. Um, it's uh, looking at the circuit and so on, but actually it's trying to better understand the representations and, uh, uh, and activations in the, uh, uh, in the neural networks. And you see that actually to, uh, I'll talk about it in a second, uh, actually in this case uh, for AI safety. So, so in particular in this case, uh, we try to, Essentially, the goal is that to build some model to monitor the activations uh, in the uh, right uh, in the neural networks, and then from this monitoring one, we want to understand certain uh, aspects of the model, and then more importantly, what we call representation reading, and secondly, more importantly, we want to be able to actually by modifying some of these activations uh, in a certain way to do what we call representation control, is that we can actually control model behaviors. So how, how this works is that it, has, it takes a multiple steps. So, so first, we design various inputs that we call stimulus. And so the stimulus are, uh, are designed in particular ways, essentially to contrast. And then you can see here, actually, the stimulus, uh, for example, these pairs of stimulus, they're mostly similar, but there's like, uh, small changes, but actually it's changes that uh, captures certain concepts that we want to capture, for example, related to honesty uh, and uh, like effectiveness and, and so on. And so we give the stimulus to the, uh, to the arm in this case, and then we observe the activities of the, 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 acti the activations uh, in the different layers of the neural networks, and then and then from observing this, uh, these activities, then we build models. Mm -hmm. So in particular, in this case, <clears throat> we, um, we observe from act uh, the activations from different layers and the model that we build, some are 
focus on single layers somehow also uh, across multiple layers. And then, uh, so what we have found is that um, essentially for different safety related concepts, such as um, honesty, hallucination, and, and others, we can actually find um, in certain layers, we can find uh, along certain directions that actually is very related to these different concepts. So for example, by building these models, we can actually identify whether um, we can have a better prediction, for example, whether the model is uh, being honest or not, uh, and so on. And then that's the first step. And then the second step is we can then also, um, from these directions that we have identified, we can then modify the, uh, the activation uh, Again, certain layers and along certain directions that we have identified, and this can help us actually change the model behaviors. For example, make the model more honest uh, or less honest, and uh, and so on. So this is um, like our first approach, illustrating that one it's very interesting that we can actually identify in the neural networks. Uh, for example, these uh, these directions. Essentially, we can identify. Uh, certain phenomena related to these safety related concepts. And also based on that, we can actually uh, have a new arsenal uh, that can help us with AI safety, which is uh, that you can actually modify uh, the, the model behavior. I think this is particularly important given that essentially that's one main difference between artificial neural networks and, and the human brain is that for these neural networks, we can really observe everything they are doing and we can um, put control uh, on the fly. And I think that can give us enormous power that can help us uh, to better win the race uh, for the AI safety. Uh, so, so with that, I just wanted to close with another, I think a very important uh, uh, part I wanted to uh, just uh, share. Um, uh, with uh, with everyone here, is that um, so? So recently, um, I mean last year, I signed a, a statement um, that, that along with many other like leading AI researchers and so on. Um, so this is the statement for uh, mitigating risks of uh, extinction from AI. So essentially mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks, uh, such as pandemics and, uh, and nuclear war. And there's, I just wanted to quickly share the, the reason why I signed this is that I think for AI, so this workshop is on understanding AI. And I actually teach a class on understanding LMs. Um, but however, we are at this really unique uh, time and uh, point uh, that I think uh, never in history before the whole like humanity is in such a situation where we have this really powerful technology, but we have essentially literally no understanding of it, how it works. Like again, I'm teaching class and also I have been, you know, part of workshops before, really just focus on understanding AI, but we, like, and also, you know, next week I'm uh, going to a meeting with uh, also like Yusha Benjo and, uh, you know, if you're leading research and so on, like the entire, I think the entire AI community would agree that we, nobody actually really understands uh, how these models work. Um, I think, give, so, so that's why there are like many unique aspects of AI. So AI capability has already exceeded a human uh, level performance on many tasks and is progressing extremely fast. And the humans are highly incentivized to continue to develop and enhance AI capabilities. And the AI capability is extremely general and widely applicable to almost all areas. And the AI agents interact directly with the world autonomously and it's going to continue to do so, uh, even more so. And we really have very little understanding of how deep learning systems work and AI systems can create new capabilities that were not even designed in, uh, in the, you know, from the original design and it can improve on its own. And also with all this, AI capabilities can be really easily misused. So, so with that, that's why I wanted to say that even though I signed the agreement, but actually, um, 
So the AI safety is actually very, very different and much more challenging than safety for nuclear and biotech for all the reasons that I mentioned here. Uh, so with that, I think, um, I mean, that's why I think the workshop is really important that so we really need to understand AI. Um, but at the same time, we have a lot of challenges uh, ahead of us. Uh, and I'm very happy to discuss more of this in the, in the panel. I think with this understanding of AI, we need to take you know, whatever approach we can take, including interpretability and including many other uh, methods. And the goal is that how we can really develop a more uh, trustworthy um, AI with uh, safety guarantees. So, so with that, so I mentioned that I'm actually teaching a class this semester. You can go to this is a class website. If it is too long, you can go to my website and then there's a link to that. So with that, yes, thanks everyone. Thank you so much. This class is amazing. All the materials are online, so I would, uh, I would encourage everyone to, to take a look at the website. Um, I think, uh, th thank you so much. This was great. I think we're, uh, we're gonna, um, we have a nice arc of discussions and, and, and debates now, and we're gonna uh, end on a, on a humanities and social sciences perspective note, which is, which is really wonderful. I think um, the, the dongle was the problem, so it should work now. So again, um, I'm uh, welcoming Dr. Claire Webb um, as our last speaker today. And then we will have, um, we will have opportunities to, to uh, I just have to say allow, yep, to discuss what was said and also, um, yeah, for the audience to ask some questions. Okay, hi, I'm Claire. Um, it's been so wonderful learning from the speakers and I'm, um, yes, I will be talking about, the, a little bit about the, the whales and, um, and embodiment. Okay, so I think of human intelligence to be iterative, cognitive, material interactions with the world. We learn speech by babbling and like mimicking mouth shapes, as Gus Farber was just talking about. We process our day through dreaming. We vividly hallucinate long dead or never to come protagonists when we read. We learn a griddle is way too hot from experiencing pain, like my little sister did. We negotiate objects and social norms through play. That's mine, that's yours. Our brain chemistry surges with oxytocin when we fall in love. Our intelligence is embodied. Oh, I'm gonna turn this on. Okay, so hopefully you agree with me. Um, okay, but these AIs, like people um, can test one notion of artificial intelligence insofar as that they lack common sense. We've all heard this argument. So um, insofar as they are transmogrified into physical objects, um, how they grasp, how they like can like move their mouths in the way that um, Gaspar was talking about, how they will identify an anomalous object, um, for instance, like computer vision on on um, self-driving cars, like is this a bike, is that a trash can, is this this like weird thing? Um, they don't have what's called what's common sense. Um, and I was reminded of um, the lead singer of the Talking Heads, uh, he had this great quote, talking about music is like dancing about architecture. Um, and I would like you, I, I, I'm, uh, I wonder what, what? Okay, <laughs> you know. Um, I'm wondering if you will agree with that as many of the AI practitioners um, in the room by the, by the time I get done with the end of my talk. Okay, so, Oops. Okay, that's fine. Um, I guess I'll just turn the sound off. Does anybody know what this is? Let's wait a second.
Okay, I'll turn this down because it's it's gonna loop. Okay, so this is um, this is a model of um, of a digesting duck um, that was built kind of like far after its original that we think burned in a in a fire in France a few centuries ago. Um, and I I put this here because I think it's really important um, to go back to the history of what we mean by artificial, um, especially intelligence, when we're going to talk about embodiment and when we expect things that, like when we're embedding AI into physical systems or using them to understand um, other bodies, such as whales. Um, so I pose these questions to you. How do entities we call artificial intelligences reform human notions of embodied intelligence? What are the material strata that facilitate cognitive processes we describe as intelligence? What can AIs learn and what can they teach us about our corporeal and embodied intelligence? Okay, so this duck um, is what's called an automaton, um, which like was was really taken up by we all know Rene Descartes. I'm so sorry, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go there. I feel like it is my duty as a historian of science to remind you. Um, so I really began thinking about the history of embodiment um, as it's entwined with the notion of artificiality, because I'm noticing that there is this weird reification of Cartesian dualism, the strict separation between mind and body um, that I kind of like thought we got over. Um, and like this view circumvents materialist claims that a necessary condition of intelligence is embodiment. So. Where does this leave humans who contemplate, build, invent, react to, learn from, teach other intelligences like AIs, and how do they contemplate us? Okay, so image classifications through CNNs that underpin the confusion, the computer vision that directs self-driving cars, um, natural language processing that is rendered in the form of an AI assistant and then bricolaged into Androids. This is an example of how, like in this dualistic way, the mind of the AI is then like embedded into these into these bodies, which are off, very often um, anthropomorphic or operate through anthropomorphic metaphors like seeing, computer vision. What does that really mean? Um, so AIs in the virtual world take data from cameras, pressure sensors, and accelerometers to learn um, and teach themselves how to better engage with the, with, the, with the physical world. Okay, so going back to Descartes. So he often invoked the metaphor of a clock to develop this dualistic understanding of, of um, mind and matter. So like a clock, the material operations of the human body followed the rational principles and were distinct from this immaterial stuff of the mind. So for Descartes, bodies were not like machines, they were machines. Um, however, and I did like a deep dive into the sixth meditation like last night and I um, found something that I maybe had missed before, which is that Descartes talks about what's called an ontological emergence. The idea that because the arrangement of their parts, automata, like this duck, like the parts in this duck, the pooping duck, um, bringing to existence a kind of property that none of the parts themselves exhibit. So to be clear, um, Descartes is not like putting forward this, uh, what he called an occult, what I called a spooky je ne sais quoi, um, like of, of something that is like ensouled. This duck is not ensouled. Um, but the idea that you could assemble these parts and that it's kind of a gestalt, like that surprised me. Um, and I think that it's important to um, remember this aspect of um, Descartes, who has informed so much of Western epistemology of how um, we, as, um, I don't know, feminist materialist historians, are reacting against dualism when it comes to uh, new machines. OK. I put to you another automaton. Yeah, I'll just 
pod, she's going to keep going. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so this is the dul dulcimer player, which was um, 1758, said to be modeled after Marie Antoinette. Um, so like a few weird things are happening here. Why are craftsmen um, building not just like this like mechanical harpsichord or like a music player that you can wind, but um, why are they creating a player in the shape of the of the human body? Why do, is she dressed um, in this like particular way? And um, like like what is her what is her inhabitation, or what do we expect of her, and why? Um, so I want to point out that she she's sophisticated, not just in her playing, but in her gestures. So if you watch, if you watch, she's like she's embodying a particular femininity that is in pre-revolutionary France expected of aristocratic women um, who like had to be cultured in the arts and also had to display this like this like um, gestural um, gestural femininity um, and so no doubt the audience who saw her who sees her um, understands that she's mechanical uh, but she foretold in her time uh, the cultural anxieties about the future of machines and human life, much in the same way that there's this um, anxiety, perhaps, about uh, AIs like automated AIs, like replacing, replacing humans, replacing human brains. Um, and so, I also want to point out that she seems like she can be magical like the duck is kind of magical and so when we construct these categories of like magical and mundane or artificial and natural, um, mind and body. The very construction of those categories foretells our future rearranging of them. And I think this is really important when it comes to um, how like physical robotics and also like um, virtual experiences are mediated through AI. OK. Um, OK, next slide. Okay. Okay, so who's played Snake? It's a little bit before my time. Yeah, okay. All right, so um, as we saw, this is like a, um, a, a neural net. Um, this uh, programmer has, through a neural net, taught this AI to beat uh, the game of Snake, which if you're not familiar is like the snake has to like eat the eat the red thing. And every time it does, it like its body grows a little bit longer. Um, and it's I, I can feel kind of myself being tense, like on the part of this like imagined human that I have in my head of like playing the game and like beating um, like beating the game. So it also can't like run into these walls. Um, and so what I want to put forward is that these metaphors of the body that we inscribe into things like robots and things like Cartesian automata um, also flow back in. Um, so like this is the, the, the YouTube user, Fengla36, um, who posted this, uses a genetic algorithm to train a computational neural network to beat this game. So in his words, you generate a population of snakes with different behaviors and then evolve them over generations to create a population of snakes that are better at the game. Um, so I just find it really curious that there's this like cycling of, of metaphors between um, humans and machines like vis-a-vis -vis, like um, biological, like the biological and the artificial. So this is a genetic algorithm um, in like in the, in the last slides, we saw the like uh, human anthropomorphic or um, corporeal projections were embedded into machines. And so there's this like, there's a, there's a dialectic happening that I think is really important. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, this is from my friend and colleague, his lab, his lab at uh, Northwestern. You might know Sam Kriegman. Um, he runs a, a lab called Xenobot. Um, so this is a creature that doesn't have like a skin. So you can imagine that this is like a this is like a Pixar movie, but it hasn't been like it doesn't have the light and shadow and the skin. The um, there's nothing. There's no environment for it. 
Um, but what Sam and his students do is they evolve virtual creatures over billions of years, um, millions of times. And what's really remarkable about these experiments is that they don't start from the point of um, assuming uh, Darwinian evolution, which as you, as we all know from like high school biology, um, that there are these like natural selection processes that uh, in which the survival of, of the fittest happens. Instead, what Sam and his and his and his students do is they create a behavior. So that is walking, swimming, flying, jumping. They start with that behavior and then they um, simulate the evolutions and they they come out with like morphological um, shapes, like the, the shape of a body that best perform that task. Um, and so in convergent evolution, uh, like a bat has wings and like a pterodactyl has wings, um, but they come from really different phylogenetic, um, phylogenetic trees, but they happen to have these things that we both call wings. What's really amazing about these virtual creatures is that they, they so like if a pterodactyl and a bat both fly and they both have wings, what this creature is doing, it's evolved toward a behavior. Like when the when our common ancestor, like the little shrew in the something scene um, after, you know, after the dinosaurs went extinct, was not like, okay, I'm gonna learn to fly to become a bat. Um, but this is something that you can do in virtual environments. So here, like the fundamental point is that virtual creatures um, evolved through these AI-driven simulations can teach us about new pathways in evolution heretofore undisclosed by nature herself. So this is the reinscription of, um, of biology from AI into a physical world. And here you see. Um, so this is like one of the creatures that his, labs, his lab created. So like, it's like meta meta. So, um, okay, we're gonna simulate these virtual creatures. We're gonna like decide that it's like walking. We're gonna give it some like energy. And then this physical creature, which is like a soft robot, came from um, a virtual reality that was exploring um, evolutionary pathways that we don't know about yet. Okay, here's just one more example. Um, this is uh, an experiment with, uh, it's called homuncular flexibility. Um, so scientists are, are learning quite rapidly that the inhabitation of an avatar in a virtual environment, um, like humans learn how to do it. So like, uh, uh, the example that I really love is you go into a virtual world and you inhabit a creature that has like a tail, like you can think of a T-Rex or whatever, and then you start to behave as if you have a tail. Like you can like watch out for stuff or you can like knock a brontosaurus or whatever. Um, you don't have good use of your hands, but you have this tail. And then it takes a while coming out of the virtual environment to like get out of the mode of of inhabiting like a being with a tail so this is just an example of like when you have a really long arm like what happens and it's really really easy it turns out um, for embodied humans to like adjust to virtual realities physically okay um so this is an argument by uh, Blaise Aguariyachkas, um, who says that large language models illustrate for the first time the way language understanding and intelligence can be disassociated from all the embodied and emotional characteristics we share with each other and with many other animals. Um, so I don't think it's worth getting into like semantic nitpicking about what embodiment means and like how it can apply to humans or AIs or like the planetary. Um, but what I do think is what what Blaze really misses here is like the the collapse of um, of different kinds of embodiment. So. Um, I think what is going to be really interesting for the future is how, um, you know, Gaspar and, and Project Studies work is um, looking at these 
sperm whales and their and their vocalizations and using technologies like drones and um, and underwater sensors and like hyd hydrophones to then correlate the vocalizations with embodied behavior um, and if we expect AI to be embodied in a certain way um, in the way that kind of blaze already has assumed has happened um, then like I think if we're going to assume like that AI has different cognitive capacities abilities um, perhaps that are like occluded we don't know about like the new the new pattern um, that the AI found that you know you didn't like expect um, we also have to account for how those um, discoveries are going to be translated transducted into the physical um, into the physical world thanks thank you so much this was absolutely fascinating Fascinating and uh, many, many wonderful, wonderful talks. I think uh, I will invite now all the speakers uh, to join me at the table. Um, we are, uh, I mean, the, the talks were so fascinating that I, I didn't have a heart to interrupt them. Um, so we are uh, running a little past the time, but um, <clears throat> I think we will have time for questions from the audience. And um, also, I think. Um, I want to I want to think about um, the future, and I think what we've seen is um, a lot of amazing work from all sorts of different perspectives that is happening in in the realm of uh, AI interpretability. And I, I guess uh, I think uh, we need to think forward and like how do we how do we um, bring together all these different perspectives, um, and how do we learn from each other, and how to maybe a close the gap between um, you know more more engineering oriented approaches and more um, maybe more um, you know humanity and society oriented approaches um, I think that's a real challenge and, a, and also a real opportunity for for the future so um, yeah I think uh, um, we need to mic uh, put the microphones uh, they, they have a, okay we are all have microphones um, and uh, I think we'll just start that with one for the Zoom? Uh, yeah, that one's for the audience. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. And, uh, I think I'll just. Um, I, I imagine there are, there's a, there there are many pressing questions from the audience. Um, but with within with this with this um, workshop in mind, I think, or with our goals in mind, I think I'd like to first. Uh, just give the public the opportunity to ask questions um, about what was said today um, and about uh, if anything resonated with, with you all. Hi, th thanks everyone. Um, oh, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, if you could, because we're from so many different places, if you could just uh, give a short introduction uh, name and, and uh, where you're from. Hi, uh, I'm Isaac. Um, I did my undergrad at Berkeley um, and uh, previously worked with Nina. And, um, so my, my question is for Dr. Bateson. I, I, I was curious about the, um, the like dictionary of learned features. And you mentioned that like one feature might do something. It might maybe activate another feature uh, or something like this. Uh, I was curious, like either now with maybe some of the smaller models you've looked at or in the future with like scaled up models, are there any like compositional or hierarchical structures to some of these learned features? I, I can just, oh, yeah. sure, I'll just use this. Uh, thank you. So, so, Yes, <laughs> in vision models, we've got we've got a lot of evidence of this. Um, there's there's um, some beautiful analyses. You just take things from from two subsequent layers. So you think of these features are talking to those. Um, they, there's some connection matrix there. You can just do PCA on that matrix and then look at that pattern. And for example, early in vision models, this will separate out you know features that are sensitive to black and white from those that are sensitive to colors, um, high frequency and and low frequency phenomenon. And my team is actively working on trying to make this go with language models, but there's a lot more features. So when you're like, I have a million by million matrix and I want to, it's just, uh, the engineering work is, is significant. But yeah, we, we certainly believe that that's, that that's happening. Hi, uh, 
I'm Brian Gallagher. I'm an editor at Nautilus Magazine. Um, you mentioned Gary Marcus Bratton earlier. Um, I was the editor on the piece go. he did for Nautilus. Uh, deep learning is hitting a wall. Um, I, I just wanted you to clarify. I, I'm not sure I caught what you said about it was in the context of AI grief or um, some of that. I think you said he was doubling down on a bad bet. Um, wh what do you mean by that? And Denialism. I, yeah. Um, okay. it, it's, it's not my main point. Uh, <laughs> to make, make on this as well. But um, uh, it, it basically, what I was sort of getting is that um, Marcus has been arguing for a really long time that machine learning and deep learning paradigms are just about at the edge of their capability and that any, any moment now it's going to stop. And he's been making this case every month for the last 10 years. And every time he makes it, and, and, and as progress has gotten better, you know, as more and more success has occurred and more and more things have been able to develop off of large language models that he has always said are impossible, the more um, extreme his, his, his argument sort of becomes in this regard. And so this is what I mean by doubling down on a, on a bad bet. The argument that he makes that we should have other approaches and that other pro you know, we should reintroduce symbolic models. We should reintroduce world models into this and, the, and that uh, Sora model doesn't, Sora doesn't actually have a, a functional world model. Like, no argument. You know, like having multiple approaches, lots of different paradigms, everything, this it would, be, would be, it would be great if Marcus were to contribute one. Hi, um, I'm Claire. I work with ASMR as an artist and AI as well now, building. I'm an engineer as well, so building some stuff. And my question's for Gaspar. I was like so fascinated to hear about the whales. And I'm curious if you've thought about using that same model or something like it to uncover like linguistic behavioral patterns. My example is obviously about whispering, how humans and animals both employ whispers in kind of similar scenarios that follow certain patterns. Um, and yeah, just curious, like baby talk, I guess, is another one for humans. But right. just if you've thought about that. Yeah, so um, well, we built this model primarily for to, to model human language learning. That was its main goal initially. And then only then we transferred it to whales. Um, I, th I think it's there are some fascinating results from that world work because um, our language contains a lot of information, right? The sp spoken language, especially. And I think um, one of the one of the thing I didn't mention in the talk, but I have a strong passion for speech <laughs> within AI interpretability because spoken language is has elements of vision. It is continuous, measurable property. And when, you know, when, when humans do spoken language, they do precisely what deep neural networks do. They take some continuous physical world and abstract it, right? Represent it with abstract units. And phonologists, which I am one, have been studying that for centuries, right? And so a speech is great, and, and speech is way simpler than vision. But it still contains a lot of information, right? So based on somebody picking a phone and saying hello. When you transcribe hello, it's always the same hello. But you can, but if you, you know, somebody picks a phone and says hello, you can profile that person for ge geography, age, gender, all sorts of things, right? Um, there's so much information in speech in some way. Well, we have observed with these models that they're very good at, that at basically, forgetting about that information and only focusing on the informative part, which is really, really interesting, right? So our models, the, you, you literally don't give them anything specific to, do, to learn. They could learn literally anything. They could learn to encode lengths of words. They could learn to encode gender of a speaker. But because they need to communicate, they kind of forget those things. They, they, they disregard those things and really focus on the important things. Um, to answer your kind of second question, we have observed the really interesting thing is that you observe that the, as they're learning, that you can you can literally. I mean, I think the fascinating thing now is that we can build these models and treat them in a sense as subjects, right? And that's like maybe for the first time. It sounds very anthropomorphic and in a sense horrible, but we're they're so good for the first time maybe that. You can literally take any linguistic experiment that we were conducting on, on humans and, and conduct it on these uh, models. 
and uh, you know we've learned we've learned that they oftentimes behave similarly to humans but we also are building models that are more realistic right and i think the exciting thing now will be to see okay here are the architectures that do things similarly to humans and we know already that there are architectures that do things differently right and so what can we learn from this dissociation or like this differences in learning and i think that is um i think we need both worlds and i think you know academia academic world is more interested in maybe building models of human learning that are more realistic and then you know industry is more interested in building models that actually do their job well um but i think you know it is i think it's our job to kind of um, use that differences and similarities to to you know make progress in various different fields okay hello uh, i have several questions i want to ask uh, professor dan song yeah my name is Shang ding and uh, i am a postdoc worker at uh, ecs department so my question is uh, what is the definition of air safety and they uh, and what is the challenge of AI safety, safety alignment of large language model? And the last question is, if we don't, they don't know the ground truth, how can we evaluate AI trustworthiness? Okay. Uh, thanks. You can also use this if you want. Okay, yeah, great. Uh, thanks for the questions. So first of all, AI safety. Um, actually, we were just writing a paper, um, actually, how to uh, essentially, like, I mean, I mean the community, actually, the AI safety term itself is actually very overloaded. Um, so so we actually just, hopefully, the, the, the paper will be published, uh, like, soon. And we're actually writing a paper talking about, you know, how these different terms, AI safety, AI security, like, what are the, what, what do they, you know, really mean when we use these terms and so on. Okay, so first of all, AI safety. So essentially the AI safety is about how to ensure that the AI machine learning systems do not cause harm. That's really the overall goal. And uh, in my talk, I also talked about AI safety in particular, talking about the adversarial setting. So traditionally AI safety, a lot of the work focus more on like the benign cases. Right? So for example, with RLHF, it tries to ensure that the large language models doesn't um, do right, uh, like it doesn't give like hate speech. And also in general, like you probably have had this certain experiences. If you ask certain questions, they actually tell you that it cannot answer, right? Like for example, it doesn't want to answer how to build a bomb and, and things like that. Um, but however, uh, it's actually really important to consider the adversarial setting. Uh, even when you talk about AI safety. And AI safety itself is actually very broad, right? Like, again, like I said, it's, it's about how the AI system doesn't cause any harm. So first of all, in terms of the harm, then, then there are many different aspects of harm, like the hate speech and fairness. These are just some examples, but also like people talk about bioweapons and you want to make sure, for example, the, the AI system, bioweapons or cybersecurity and, uh, and also, for example, like for generative AI, how it's, right now a big issue is um right like a lot of these you can say it's a fake and there's fake videos and and so on like and there are many different motivations why people want to generate fake videos and you may have heard about like the Taylor Swift uh, incident and and things like that right so all these again the harm itself there are many different aspects of harm and also then you talk about the model itself the the models have different uh, levels of capabilities. Uh, even the model today, right? For example, generating these fake videos and uh, you can do voice cloning and they can be so good and already it's causing a lot of harm. But uh, also at the end of my talk, I talked about the other type of harm, which is uh, even more extreme when the model gets really, really powerful, then we are talking about you know, huge potential risks, like even for extinction and, and, and so on. And so, so that's why, like, uh, this is maybe, uh, uh, you know, like, AI safety is so, there's so much, right? So I'm trying to give a summary of the scope of AI safety. And uh, uh, does that answer your question? Hi, uh, I'm, um, uh, my name is Johan. I'm a visiting scholar at Film and Media. And this is also a question for Professor Song, but I guess it relates to, to uh, a lot of the talks. Um, 
So you were talking about the differences between uh, GPT 3.5 and, 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 and 4, and so it seems that um, the more competent model, um, the GPT 4 in this instance, is also less steerable, let's say. So basically, you know, don't don't push me into a corner and I'll perform better, you know, to put, just to put it in a simplified way. So my, my question is, this is my first question, uh, what does that tell us about the nature of this kind of intelligence? And, and I guess the other question is, um, it seems that nevertheless, these models are easily fooled, right? And, and so, um, Basically, when they break down, they they tend to demonstrate that yeah, there's actually no common sense in here, um, and uh, there might be lots of other stuff, but but perhaps uh, they they fail in this. They have these interesting failure modes, and so um, maybe this uh, lack of common sense might be viewed as a quality, in fact, of this kind of alien intelligence is that is that one way to think about it and 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 what might that mean mean uh, um to you thank you we'll just take a couple of questions here sure uh i'm noah i'm a student in the linguistics department but in the um, recent past i had some exposure to the legal world and i was just curious what you all thought about um the uses of interpretability in the courts because I mean people who use models have already gotten sued and they will get sued again uh, and I'm wondering whether you think the current interpretability paradigms are up for explaining what what uh, decisions the models made and why to something like the FDA or the legal uh, or an appeals court um, who haven't been friendly to social sciences in the past yeah Thank you. hello um, my name is Sha so I am um, a PhD student from Technical University Berlin and a visiting scholar in here, the Center of Built Environment. Uh, my effort is trying to uh, develop the machine assistance to help the different designer engineer to um, work while they're doing their designs or and stuff. So my, my entire effort of my dissertation is try to bring the domain knowledge and different levels of the knowledge into machines and it does um, do like a whole, you know, yeah, user and machine symbiosis to reinforce our um, cognitions and help us to develop the new or discover the new patterns. And at the end of my dissertation, I have the worries that if um, if we can have a machine can close the loop between the knowledge application and knowledge discovery. Um, that's two questions. So, is there any efforts in in the industry doing so? And the second is if these things happened, how we position ourselves in the in the future, because that's also a really key point I want to discover in my end of dissertation. Thank you. That's a, that's a wonderful question, by the way. I mean, there's like so many things, um, but that's something I'm curious as, as well, because I, I know Anthropic is maybe one of the leading firms that is putting a lot of interest in, in interpretability itself. Like what's what's the industry's take on interpretability? Because it's it's I think it's currently more difficult to sell it than you know the actual performance. But like I, I'm I'm really curious to hear the industry's perspective on that. Yeah, I think I think that it's early days still. Um, now things feel like suggestive, um, and they often give you predictions you can then back out in terms of behavior. You know, so I feel very good when we've uncovered a little circuit and, and there seems to be some interference and maybe I could just swap this out for some Korean character uninvolved and because of the way the weights go that should trigger a behavior and you can sort of back it out in behavior. I think that um, we are not at the point yet where this would be ready for legal arguments um, but I think it, we, we are approaching the point where you can use it to to distinguish between hypotheses and try to kind of get it get at these in in other ways. Um, was there a Follow up question. No, that, that okay. Yeah, I mean, so that's for, on the that's on the legal ripeness side. Yeah, I, th I think for for it's a great question that has been open about legal um, implications of this work, and I think for legal, I think that's another that's a that's a um, topic for another topic <laughs> for another uh, um, workshop. I think we would need to have some some legal expert, but it's a, it's definitely something that is really really exciting. And uh... I think one thing that is emerging though is that um, models will solve a problem in many ways and combine those heuristics. 
um, and and one way you can you can see this is often if you if you present the question in code so that more of the model has to go more of its capacity has to go to just figuring out what it was maybe it's in an image it has to decode or instead of using um, you know standard ascii characters you use like the cursive alphabet in unicode and so that's just like very rare it has to figure out what was going on um, then you will see qualitatively different answers and has less room less to answer the question there's still something left at the end that it can use and so i think that whatever um, these tools how these end up working we will begin to see that kind of bag of heuristics that gets used and i think that the legal framework will have to confront that um, and maybe in a more um, explicit way than it does with people where you know you have you have like well how did this person come to this decision and you can ask them and you just get some ex post justifications and you can prove as many people at this university have through controlled studies that people are relying on certain cues or side information or the tone of voice which might not have been represented in the text to make those decisions and the models will be the same ways and so I think it might it might accelerate that confrontation um, with the the difference between like a stated way of reaching a conclusion and the kind of mess of heuristics that, that, that people and machines actually do use. And, and I just want to relate to the, the really interesting point that, that was raised about hallucinations and about maybe deviant behavior in these models that we are also, you know, judgmental about. Uh, but I think that devi that unpredictable behavior is actually super valuable for understanding what the model is doing internally. I, and I can give you a related um, example from my lab. Um, so we, I'm working with the generative adversarial networks, or GANs, who are not, not as popular anymore because they're very difficult to train, but they're very interesting for cognitive modeling perspective because they're very creative and they never see the data. They need to learn to imitate it, which is, which is interesting. And um, one thing that was like very informative for our lab was actually those, you know, those outputs that engineers would throw away because they were, you know, new outputs, they were violating the training data, they were deviating from the training data. And so as an, as an engineer, if I only cared about performance, I would throw them away. As you know, if I look at LLMs, if I only want to release a product that doesn't do hallucination, I look at hallucination and I want to minimize them. As a cognitive modeler, and I think that's why it's important to have different perspective on this, as a cognitive modeler, I'm way more interested in those deviant behavior because they can tell me what is different, what, what, how, are they, how are they doing these, how are they learning? And one of the exciting things that came from that kind of you know, questions was like, we trained the models on eight words, eight English words, a, a couple of hundred repetitions of eight English words. And it started the, saying new words that it never heard before. English, fine English word, like it says start, and it never heard start before, or it says coffee, and it never heard coffee before. And so it, it is, you know, how, how what, what, I think these deviant behavior, if I can call it that way, the, 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 the way they're violating training data, or the way they're violating our expectations can actually be extremely insightful um, if we're ready to take, you know, to take a look at them. Maybe maybe one more last set of questions, um, and then we'll we'll continue the, this discussion at lunchtime for sure. Um, but this is this is wonderful. Hi, um, I'm Samin. I'm doing a PhD and fellowship in computational images. Um, maybe this one more for Professor Bratton. Um, kind of a speculative question. I wonder if in the future um, there's a diminishing of like the human in the loop. If there is like with um, synthetic data or reinforcement learning with AI, um, if we can speculate out and there's a sort of diminishment of, of the human um, and the AIs are sort of interfacing with each other, what kind of distribution of outcomes do you think are possible for better or worse in that kind of, in that kind of world? Uh, my question is to Dr. Bateson. Um, so I'm Arda. I did my undergrad here. Now I'm at UCSF. Um, I was kind of wondering. You talked about like using like an autoencoder, like sparse autoencoders, to sort of look at like a small transformer. I was wondering like if you like tried like a similar experiment on like a, for example, like a mixture of expert, and then and then you take like every expert and then like treated that as your smaller transformer to sort of see like if you can see feature routing or like you know how like everything is kind of learned.
I think we'll have this round of questions and then we're gonna have some lunch. Um, so, Professor Braden, maybe in first. Uh, should, I, should I use that or should I? Oh, it doesn't. Okay, I'll just be a good, nice prop though. Um, I think it's a. I think it's a very interesting question. I think it's one that's both has really important philosophical and also practical implications um, in terms of the kinds of models that we're building and the kinds of demands that we're that we're making on them in one way or another. And and I, I think there's much discussed, but. One thing I think we might look back on to the present, from the future to the present, um, is it may seem right now most of the models that we build are based on data that has been produced by not just humans as a whole, but individual human users generated in the in the aggregate. What did you search for? What did you say? What are you interested in? What did you want to buy? Where did you go? All sorts of things as well. Um, if we take the old motto of to organize the world's information and make it useful, clearly there's a lot more information in the world and as the world, as the, as the physical structure of the world, than just that tiny little slice. Um, and that kind of anthropomorphization, that kind of you know, demand of a kind of mirroring of a particular kind of, not just a kind of intelligence, but also a kind of data from which intelligence would be gathered, may come to be seen as quite limiting. And so that's why I think you know, projects like SETI with a C and also SETI with an S, I guess, are, are, are really are important in this kind of regard. Um, because it, it, the kinds of models that might be built are, are more useful. So, you know, you take the question of, as every journalist asks, you know, what is the role of AI and how we stop climate change? Um, the first thing to remember is that the very idea of climate change itself is an epistemological accomplishment of planetary scale computation without the sensors and most importantly supercomputing simulations we don't have that that sense of how planetary systems work and how it is that anthropogenic agency would 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 fit within them but more importantly is that you know if we were to take you know all the if i were to hand you all the information that meta has from facebook and say okay here it is here's all the cat videos and likes and, and angry posts and like there you go now solve climate change with that it's it's clearly the wrong data in one sort of around this as well. So I think there's a really important question of not only humans in the loop in the cybernetic sense, but to what extent is a particular understanding of, of, of data availability and what kind of data, you know, what data we really need in order to produce the most socially useful models, the most ecologically useful models, culturally useful models, and where the data would need to come from in order to produce those and how it would be constructed and trained. Because I think one of the things we're definitely seeing and I think the adversarial issues go to this as well, but also some of the kinds of bizarre accidents that come from attempting to um, uh, detoxify models, like what we saw with Gemini um, in the last couple of weeks, is that increasingly politics is a politics about what are the models of society that we have. It always has been to a certain extent. What is the social representations we have of society and how do the, and are those appropriate? Are they inclusive? Are they, are they necessary? But increasingly, those models, as they become the externals into AI, the, that the politics of models um, and what they include, what they say, how they represent the world become more important. And so in this regard, I think we should get much more broadly um, than just the kind of relatively uh, small data set that we have now. And there's a lot of practical reasons for this as well. But the, the bigger question, I guess, is that, and I'll stop here, it has to do with, um, with the kinds of discoveries, and this goes to this gentleman's question here about the alien intelligences and these other sorts of forms, we find the kinds of diversities of mind that we may be able to produce that, 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 that occur for this, that we may be actually, by trying to optimize all these models towards the most functional model, um, we may actually be, in a way, cutting off a lot of paths of possibility there uh, in order to make like the one generic utility that might not be the, actually the best path is that we'll discover lots of different definitions of intelligence and what this means in this regard. Um, you know, I, I think Aguariarchus's intelligence that he was referring to in, in the quote that, 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 that Claire showed was a very specific kind of intelligence that he was speaking to having to do with the, um, the, the based on predictive processing paradigm, identifying like, look, artificial neural networks work on stochastic prediction, natural networks work on stochastic prediction. There's ways in which there's, a, there's this correspondence. So two things. One is we may identify something like um, a kind of shallow anthropomorphism with AI and a deep anthropomorphism with AI. The shallow anthropomorphism is sort of Turing test things. Does the AI pretend, does the AI able to perform thinking the way that I think that I think? 
therefore it's intelligent, right? And so I think this could also go to the question of embodiment to a certain degree in terms of the way Dreyfus used that here at Berkeley many years ago, where like, is it embodied like I'm embodied, and therefore does it have an embodied intelligence like I'm embodied? And if it doesn't, then we're disqualified. There's a deep anthropomorphism, or maybe you know, biomorphism, maybe a better word, that it turns that artificial neural networks and natural uh, neural networks do operate on some kind on similar generic principles that are correspondent to one another. That may have something to do with the kind of fundamental dynamic of intelligence as we can identify it. That's actually kind of different than the terminology that we've inherited about that about, about that about what that intelligence is. And so this is the question. We don't really know. Nobody really knows. Like, to what extent or is this contingent? To what extent is this defined? To what extent are we discovering something that is sort of held up by the language that we're using? And to what extent can we actually change the language and the concepts we're using to make sense of what's right in front of us, rather than having scholastic debates about is this conscious, not conscious? Does it have a soul, not have a soul? Things like that. So anyway, thank you. Oh, uh, our very last question. Yeah. This one's easy. Uh, no. <laughs> I share your intuition that looking at the expert level makes a lot of sense and that interactions between experts may be much more constrained. And I think there's now open source models with experts in them. And I would be very interested to see research on the topic. All right. I think uh, it is time to conclude. Um, I thank you, every, everyone, for your um, amazing questions, for um, wonderful talks. I think uh, this is the beginning of a conversation. I think uh, we have learned from today that uh, today's presentations that it is exciting time. Um, and I think um, understanding humans and machines will be will be there for a while. And I'm looking forward uh, yes. <laughs> to, to hearing uh, how uh, in what direction we go. And I think this panel just confirms that uh, an interdisciplinary approach is absolutely necessary. So thanks, everyone. Uh,